Hi, everyone. Um, well, yeah, so my name is Darina and I work at Base Esports Solutions. And what we do is we work with esports. So Dota, League of Legends, Counter-Strike, maybe you've heard of them. Maybe you also know that there's a huge businesses, uh, outgrowing traditional sports. And what we do is we have a data exchange platform and we have an esports directory where we track matches. And finally, we predict who's going to win and convert it into betting odds. And the part uh, about betting odds is where we actually need the ratings. And myself, I'm a lead data scientist at Base. We are four data scientists currently, and we are growing very rapidly. So what are we talking about here? A skill rating, we're going to say, is an estimation of the true skill of a competitor from their observed competition results. And to give you an outline, what we're going to do, we're going to talk a lot about ratings, mostly about the ELO ranking. Then we're going to talk about LICO a little less and very briefly talk about true skill. And Bundesliga will be our example. So if you came here for details about true skill or for details about LICO 2, um, then uh, I'm not upset if you leave. Unfortunately, this is an introductory talk, so we're going to be focusing on the basics. So introduction, why do we need accurate ratings at all? Well, in my business, we need them to predict match outcomes. But another very cool application which comes with match outcomes is that we can use them to predict out, uh, upsets. So if we have the ranking of every single team in the world, then we can look at uh, how, much, how big was the difference between ranks and then see, oh man, they, they should never have won, but they did. Like, for example, South Korea against Germany. Some of you might remember this happened a year ago, and uh, this is actually, I think, number three upset on this list. This is historic, or historically, so... If you look here at the ratings difference, this was pretty bad. Um, we can also use ratings for qualifications for tournaments. So you have to be at least this good in order to participate. And of course, this also gives me as a player or as a team an incentive to improve my performance because if I can measure it against other people's performance. And it's entertainment. It's fun to talk about ratings. It's fun to look at these tables. And finally, in online video games, so the last 20 years, we need ratings in order to balance our matches. And this is a very hot topic because if you go online and you look at ratings, then people will be complaining all the time. And most people will be complaining without actually understanding what they're complaining about because they don't know how the algorithms work. So um, what are the requirements for ratings? First of all, they have to be easy to use. Your normal matchmaker will take one, maybe two values. They will not take a distribution. They will not take an ensemble method or whatever else you have. Um, they have to be uh, very easy to tune because normally people who run the league are not mathematicians, so they will mess it up if, this, if it's so complicated. Uh, they have to, of course, give a good prediction of match outcome. This is actually how we evaluate our rating algorithms. <laughs> and they have to converge fast because if you launch a new game and you have unranked players all over the place and it takes you a month to converge, nobody will be playing anymore because everybody will be smashed. And uh, once you have established ratings, it should still be easy to add new players because, again, um, a new player will want to have a good experience and not be mismatched uh, for their first 20, 30 matches. Uh, on the other hand, for established players, we want to have no stagnation of ratings. So even if I'm already very, very good and very, very leveled, every single match will still have an impact on my rating. And finally, they have to be hard to manipulate by gaming the system. So, for example, if uh, we're playing a video game and I'm getting points for self-healing, I'll just going to be standing in a corner damaging myself and healing myself. And that's also not a good rating algorithm. Uh, mathematically, what we can say, why are we talking about Bayesian ratings? We are going to assume that we have a skill that is unknown, but it's drawn from a distribution, and normally we'll use logistic. And after each match, uh, the team's, the team's uh, skill will change by an unknown amount. Then the team will play a match, uh, and the real performance will be exhibited. And we can update our posterior distribution with uh, this um, result. So how it looks in real life is we have, for example, here the prior distribution. Then our player or team will play sample matches, and they will... Uh, here they have won a plot because their rating has increased. At the same time, the uh, scale of the logistic has decreased, so we have become, we have become more certain about this skill. And so what do we need to do when we want to have a rating algorithm? We have to first choose a distribution. Then we have to choose the parameters of a distribution. And then we will have to find an update rule how to handle match results. And one very simple and very famous approach is ELO. So he, who, who here has an ELO rating and knows the ELO rating? Ah, quite a lot of people call. 
So ELO comes from chess. It was created by chess player mathematician Apart ELO uh, already in the 60s. And uh, it's very common now. It's been adopted by most traditional sports. And you'll find it in chess and baseball and basketball. You will also find it in the social network movie where they're creating this face, ma face smash algorithm and comparing uh, the hotness of girls. And as we'll just see in the next slide, this formula is actually wrong. <laughs> so ELO the player starts with a fixed amount of points of initial rating, and their true player skill is approximated by logistic distribution around the rating with the scale X, which S, which is fixed. And then they play against a player B who has their own rating B with the same scale. And we can calculate the expected outcome of A versus B with this formula here. So where does this come from? It probably looks familiar to most of you because this is our logistic CDF. So we have uh, our rankings as a logistic here. And if we just substitute these S by this expression, we will make it into something which is e to the power, which is 10 to the power of, of something else. And if we now uh, substitute the mu with the ranking of our opponent, then we arrive at this formulation here. So we essentially, we are evaluating the cumulative distribution function of our opponent at our own ranking. And what's interesting here is, um, if we look at this, if this here is exactly equal to n, so if our difference in points is exactly n, then we have here 1 over 11, and this means that our chance of winning is uh, 10%. So our opponent will win 10 out of 11 games. And this is the meaning of n in this formula. So n uh, defines a power of 10 in skill. So if you have an ELO of uh, 1,000 and a grandmother has an ELO of 2,500, then you have a 1 in a, I think... 10,000 chance of winning. Good luck. So here, for example, we have uh, an ill difference of 200, and we arrive at about one quarter probability of winning. So going back to our ELO, we now have our rankings. We have um, a way of computing our expected win probability, and now we play a real match, and we have a real outcome, which we just say is 1 if we win, it's uh, 0 0.5 if we lose, uh, it's if we draw, and 0 if we lose. And now we do our rating update simply by saying our new rating is our old rating uh, plus the difference of our expected outcome minus, uh, uh, and the real outcome scaled by some factor k. And this k is the most important part of the algorithm. Because again, if we just look at it and think about it, let's say we predicted this player is going to certainly win almost zero and they won, uh, almost to certainly lose if it's almost zero and they won. So here we have one and the uh, ranking will be updated by exactly k points. So in other words, k is our sensitivity. And this means if we choose k, it has to be appropriate for n, because if we give the player n points every time they have an upset, then their ranking will be jumping around a lot. And also k should be appropriate for the match format. So if we have a lot of games in the season, and it's okay to lose one game, so for example in baseball, even the best team will lose like one third of the games, um, then k should be small and one match should not affect the ratings as much. On the other hand, if we are in NFL or in college basketball, then every match matters because there are fewer matches, so K should be large. We can also base K on experience. So, um, for example, in chess, we'll have K equal to 40 for new players, so um, their rankings will, ch uh, will uh, change faster. Then, if they have played 30 games but they've never been a grandmaster level, then K will decrease to 20. And then everyone else here are the very top players, and they will have K10. So again, this means that if a grandmaster loses to somebody who's a new player, then the new player's rating will go up for 40 points. But the grandmaster will only lose 10, which makes sense because they're an established player. They should not be punished as much. In football, um, we will have for the world, for the national team rankings, we will have 60 for the World Cup because everybody's playing very, very seriously. Then 40 for the qualifiers, and then we go down until the friendly matches. Well, maybe not even the A team is going to be on the field, and we have K equals 20. But again, because we have fewer football matches than we have chess matches, the total scale of K is greater. And as promised, Bundesliga. So I chose two teams. I chose Bayern because everybody knows they're a very strong established team. In fact, we see them winning the Bundesliga quite a lot here. And I chose Eintracht Frankfurt mainly because it's my friend's favorite team. And um, so... We have three variants of K here. We have K equal to 10, which is the default of the Python package uh, written by Sabli. And then we have 30 and we have 60. And we, of course, as expected, we see that uh, for 60, the rating jumps up and down quite a bit. And for 10, it stays almost, almost constant. 
and climbing here quite slowly. And then from this, we can get our expected min probability of Eintracht versus Bayern, and this is oscillating around 0 0.3, which um, it's up to you if, it's, if this is a good rating or if it's a bit overvaluing Eintracht. Um, What's quite interesting here is, as we see for Bayern, the, all the ratings increase very high here in around 2013, and then they suddenly fall down. And I would like you, to, uh, maybe after the talk, to think about why does this happen, because if you understand why this happens, then you have understood the ELO algorithm. So in summary, the key ideas are, we have a player skill, which is approximated by just a distribution of fixed scale. The improbability is given by the cumulative distribution function of the logistic, and the distribution mean is updated after each match, resulting in a new rating. If you want to tune this, we have to choose initial rating first, then we have to choose n to choose k, and then make adjustments for our domain. So we can play around with k. We can also say, okay, home, maybe home team has, has an advantage, so home team gets less points if they win. Maybe we have a margin of victory as an additional factor. Maybe in chess we will use chess uh, piece color. So there's Really, this is up to you, this is your domain knowledge, and it's the most important part of working with these algorithms. Um, speaking of tuning, how do we tune? Well, we want to minimize the expected core score versus the outcome. We call this the Briar score in our application. This is uh, really just mean squared error. The cool thing about these algorithms is that our entire data set is our test set, because uh, if we just take the rating before the match, then we can use every single row. Except we should probably ignore the calibration period, because uh, if we look back at this, especially here in the beginning, this little bump here, we don't want to have this in our test, because this is not an actual measure of our rating. Uh, non issues about ELO, there are quite a few. So first, and the main, main one is inactivity doesn't, have, doesn't affect the ratings. Again, going back to Eintracht, here and here, Eintracht didn't even play, because they weren't in the Bundesliga. But the rating remains constant. And because of that, players will try to protect their ranking. They will just only play people where they know they will not lose a lot of points. Uh, time between matches is not factored. Uh, new players might be overvalued. Again, rem remembering Eintracht, if you, if they are below their new player rating and a new team comes from the second Bundesliga, then, um, you might argue, are they really stronger by default? Maybe not. And uh, a minor problem is that you have inflation and deflation of rankings when a lot of people join or, uh, or leave it, uh, a scene. This is actually only a problem if you want to compare historical data, because you can't. And only two ratings are updated at a time. So, but this is actually not a problem, because this thing is, ELO was designed to be easy and simple and easy to understand. I mean, if you just learned Python today, you're going to be able to write this. And this is already taking a lot more code than it would need to. And this is our entire algorithm. And you can do this with pen and paper also. But the fact is we do have computers, and so we can do more. And this more is called Glico. So Glico, again, uh, is developed by someone who called it after, after himself. This case, in this case, Mark Lickman, again, chess player mathematician. He then himself improved it uh, to be Glico 2, which he is released actually quite recently. It's very well documented. He has a website just about Glico, so it's super cool to look at. And you will find it mostly online. So many video games use it. Chess.com uses it. Go online uses it. Key idea that we now have not only the rating, but also the rating deviation. So the rating deviation will decrease with your match results because we become more certain about uh, your ability. And then it will increase if you're inactive. The rating uh, uh, itself, um, the rating deviation uh, depends on volatility, which is inconsistent in your performance. And the skill is given as a confidence interval now because we have a varying scale, so we we'll usually use uh, two standard deviations or two scales. And um, one other major innovation is that uh, the rating periods are now being used. This means that we take several matches at, and we use them for rating at once, and then we release a new rating. Um, I'm going to talk about this in more detail. So, first of all, what does this rating decay mean? Well, uh, you have your ranking, and then you play a match, your ranking changes, and at the same time, our, ins our insecurity about your ranking drops down. But then, while, while you don't play, it will slowly rise again, because as you don't play, you don't exhibit any results, so your, your, the uncertainty rating deviation is constantly growing. 
And in Glico 1, this was just a time constant. So you would say, okay, it should take this long for your rating to decay back to that of an unrated player. It was, for example, in just 10 years. In Glico 2, this is a bit more complex now. The rating deviation itself is a function of another parameter, sigma, which is constrained by some tuning parameter, tau, which regulates how much your ranking can change at once. Um, it, if you're going, uh, going to work with this, you will get a feeling for how tau and sigma influence each other. So this is really something you need to <laughs> understand yourself. And the reason why I'm not explaining it here is because Glico looks like this. And here, not even every single uh, of these letters is explained. But if you look at it from further away, it's not that complicated. Because again, we have the old rating, uh, and we have some k, which now is a function of our rating deviation and our sigma. And we have uh, then, now for all our opponents in the rating period, and not just for one guy as before, we have our actual outcome versus our minus our expected outcome. And we multiply by some constant which, which depends on the rating deviation of our opponents. So ultimately, we're still taking the error between our prediction and our outcome and um, giving some points to our final rating. We're just doing it in a bit more complex, more dynamic fashion. Um, here's a cool example that I stole from this very, very good paper that I recommend you to read. Um, Grandmaster Gatakamski was somebody who was, I think, ranked, ranked top four in the world. And then he lost to, I think, Kasparov and quit chess for several years and came back. So the ELO stays constant for the entire time. The Glico also stays constant because the rating itself doesn't change with time, but the rating deviation decays. So when the ELO, when he plays again and he loses points, the ELO goes down a little bit, but the Glico goes down significantly. And the reason for this is that while he wasn't playing, his, his rating deviation has increased so much. And then as he plays again and he slowly gets better, again, the Glico reacts much faster. Going back to our chess, I would like now to talk about this um, series, this rating period. So the rating period uh, is how many games, how, many, how much time, how many games in, the f in a period of time are we going to take for our rating. And for soccer here, I chose three different periods. I chose one day as a period, which doesn't really make much sense because the requirement of the algorithm is 10 to 15 games per team. And then I chose one month and finally one season. And we can see, of course, for season, the rating will be much more smooth because um, we t we're converting all the games, all the results. And then we get a lot more deviation in the monthly and even more deviation in the, in the uh, daily. But what's actually more interesting to look at is our um, sigma and tau. So... Uh, as an intuition, large sigma, large tau means more variation in uh, our rating deviation in our, than small ones. So we can see here our rating deviation. And like I said before, in this part and in this part, uh, Eintracht did not play in the Bundesliga. And we can really see, here, see this here. We can see by these waves, there, was no, there are no results. So our rank, our deviation is increasing. And of course, and, and again, we can see that uh, for greater tau, it's, in it's increasing a lot more than these little bumps here for very conservative values. Again, this is available online. This is implemented by uh, the same guy who did the Glico. So um, you can use it, but remember to tune these values first. Um, and just to remind you, for when we talk about Glico ratings, we talk about rating and the deviation. We don't talk about just the rating. Otherwise, uh, it's unfair because, for example, here um, we can see that there was uh, that actual the actual Glico rating would be here. And another point, another thing I want to point out is that all these measures they should not be compared among each other. Here we have the ELO in red, and then we have the three Glicos we talked about before. Instead, we can only use them as compare, to compare teams against each other in the same framework. So if you compute, uh, compute the win probability again, remember before I said that I think that Eintracht has been a bit overvalued by ELO? Well, Glico is uh, agreeing with me here. And in fact, the most recent three matches, they lost quite devastatingly against Bayern. So in summary, again, the key ideas here, we have this rating deviation. We have the volatility of the rating, which um, depends on how well we are performing, but also decays with time. And we have a rating period of several games that we have to have. So if we want to choose this, first we have to choose a rating period that fits our structure of the, of the tournaments. 
Well, to the initial values, the defaults are quite good. For Gleco 1, we will choose how long it will take for ratings to decay. For Gleco 2, we will choose how uncertain our ratings may become and how, um, much of un how much the uncertainty can change within one period. And known issues here are, first of all, because we have this constant decay of rating, the, um, uh, they are only valid at the time of their computation. The moment they are published, they are already becoming invalid because the rating decay is increasing constantly. And during the rating period, we only have provisional ratings. We don't have the true ratings yet. And the impact of one single match in this whole rating period is not um, transparent. So we can't say, okay, if they win this match, they're going to be number one because nobody knows. And not sure, maybe I made it possible. Maybe I explained it well, maybe I didn't. But in general, it's hard to explain, especially if people don't have a math background. How much time do I have left? Oh, okay. Cool. Um, so, true skill. The third algorithm on the list. Honestly, in my opinion, the talk should have ended with Glico because these are the two ratings that give us um, pretty good returns. But TrueScale is the password when it comes to ratings. You will find it everywhere online, so I didn't want to not include it. But the thing is, TrueScale solves a very different problem. So what they do, what they say is, we have teams online, so we have players queuing for matches online, and we want to build teams of these players which are almost equally matched, so they have can have a uh, matched game. So like before, if you're playing pickup basketball and captain select the teams. We can't have this online, so we have to have some other way of having balanced teams. So TrueSkill doesn't as much care about rating players in order, they care more about maximizing the draw probability, which is not exactly the same thing. So initially it was developed for Halo, but you can find it in uh, a lot more games now. It assumes that player skill is normally distributed. Remember before we were talking about logistic. Um, if the team is composed about, of several players, then uh, they're... Uh, team skill is a joint distribution of these player skills. And after the match, then the posterior distribution of all the players will be updated. And they have a very clever way of updating the posterior distribution, but unfortunately this is proprietary. So um, this is actually my main problem with TrueSkill, but I don't want to talk about it so much because it is fairly well documented, but there is no official package to have to do it. There is no official paper giving you all the implementation details. Um, it's trademarked, it's patented. You are officially not allowed to use it. Um, but if you do use it, uh, there is a package by Yang Su Pli again, <laughs> which looks pretty much correct. And there's also a very good paper by Mose where this is a guy who, he went uh, into this algorithm and he went into all the details and then summed up his findings. So the benefits of true skill, it's, it's very similar to Glico in functioning, but it can update after each match. Um, it converges pretty fast for new players, which is very good because if you play online, like I said, you want to have a quick estimate as fast as possible. And it has solutions for things like partial play, or if you have several teams com uh, competing, um, or if you have people who quit in the middle of the match, then it can handle that. The other algorithms don't. Um, but the shortcomings are, like I said, it's proprietary. Also, if it's player-based, it means that every single player now has to have a minimal amount of games. And for example, in our business, we want to predict the outcome between teams who are going to play and professional teams who are going to play. So we need to know every single player who is going to play. And we can't because maybe somebody's grandmother died. Um, and finally, it's difficult to tune model parameters here because, especially in true skill two, they will impact. They will also take domain-specific impact, like um, how does your kill rate uh, affect your win rates, etc. And they say in the paper that they need a thousand games for that. In traditional sports, a thousand games are several years sometimes. So. In my personal opinion, uh, it's easier to model a team based on their historic performance together if they have historic performance. Of course, if you're modeling ad hoc form teams, then you have to use something like TrueScale. Um, so in summary, um, rating algorithms need to be tuned. Ratings algorithms need time to convert. You can't immediately use them. They can then be used to predict match outcome. And there is no best algorithm. Like in any machine learning application, uh, the best algorithm is the one that fits your domain. But often ELO will be good enough. 
And if you have players who don't play regularly, then you should be looking to Glico. And if you have players um, forming teams ad hoc and not playing together, this is when you would maybe look at true skill. And domain knowledge here is better than having a fancy algorithm because if you have domain knowledge, then you can model your um, then you can model these particulars in your algorithm just by saying how many points are you going to give extra to somebody. Yeah, so this went a lot faster than expected. Um, I, so I have time to thank my friend and colleague Ben Steinhusen, who runs the website Dat Dota uh, and does nothing but um, great Dota teams there. And a lot of sources. Um, they are actually quite interesting reads if you want to look more into this. And uh, there was a typo here on this ratings talk, but uh, all the plots I made here are um, in this uh, repo and how to call these packages in this repo. It's not super clean because um, I was writing it as I was preparing the presentation, but you can at least find examples of how to use the packages. Thank you very much. So any questions? Yes, maybe I first go up here. No, yeah. Oh, thanks. Um, cool talk, lovely topic. Uh, just out of curiosity, uh, what's the, is, is there a reason why they prefer the logistic uh, distribution over the Gaussian one? Yes, good question. Actually, um, no, I don't have a slide for this. Uh, but the <laughs> um, so the, if you think about the shape, the Gaussian is a bit more. A bit, the logistic is flatter. So the tails are thicker, exactly. So, so you, you have the chance of upsets becomes less. Hi, thank you for your talk. The question would be: In game like Dota, mm -hmm. does this algorithm perform the same as in Halo or CS? Because you have different types of characters and technically completely different skills. Um, again, good question. So, first of all, I have this. I should prepare the slide. So, <laughs> here we have the real scores of different algorithms for Dota specifically. Um, the thing is, the algorithms don't actually fit the skills that you need. They fit the performance of the players. So, the performance will be a function of the skills that you need for the game, if you know what I mean. So, yeah, they will perform the same way. But, um, for example, in true skill, they do model different um, game modes of Halo differently. But then they also assume that the skills are transferred pretty well, and so they might sometimes still use a different game mode for um, tuning the, the, uh, a new game mode before it's released. So, uh, the answer your question, or um, about tuning, mm -hmm. uh, is there any specific technique how you can tune K and N? Um, uh, well, you can write something like your own CV, for example, for this cross validation. Um, no, no specific technique. Really just have a good initial guess, see how it performs, and then go from there. To my knowledge. I'm uh, interested in the setting with uh, ad hoc teams uh, mm -hmm. forming. So um, I just want to ask for clarification. Does true skill uh, rank the individual players? Yes. And uh, you mentioned some inconveniences with uh, true skill. Uh, uh, do you know of uh, good alternatives? Uh, well, there's a lot of alternatives. Um, well, first of all, you can also use Glico and Elo in order to have these ad, ad hoc teams. You'll just have to cheat a little bit and say how you update after the match is that you'll just distribute this. So what you will, what you will do is you will just, um, say we have the initial distributions of all the different players with a Glico, for example, and then we'll say again, the team is just the joint distribution. Another question becomes, how do we update this? And we, if we just say, okay, the win is the win of every single player the same way. Then we can just update them the, the same way as we did before. And, uh, Truskar does that a little bit more cleverly because they don't, they don't think how many, how many minutes did the player play, etc. That's the only difference. There's also an algorithm called whole history rating where they look at the entire performance of, uh, the player through time. Very computationally in intensive. And um, yeah, so most algorithms you find, like for League of Legends, for Overwatch, there will be some variations of true skill and uh, Glico, basically. I mean, true skill itself is already the variation of Glico, to be honest. Ah, okay. sorry, another chair. Yeah. <laughs>
<laughs> yes. Thank you, really nice talk, and as a gamer, at least I know why I'm on the bottom of the list. So, uh, but my question is, um, it's completely out of the topic in a sense. Um, I would like to move the, uh, these out of the box and ask you, would it make sense to apply these for like medical data? Um, if you, if you think of, you can come up with a function to give a score to a pathogen or, or a cancer. And then you give a score to the to the patient with its uh, or his or her uh, medical status and um, treatment applied. Would it make sense to apply these uh, algorithms to predict the outcome of healing the patient or not? So I would have to think about it longer, but my initial uh, feeling is no, because every cancer only plays once, and. Yeah, so basically we don't have a performance over time because every patient probably is different. I don't know. I have no medical background, so I'm really swimming here. But I, I don't think that's a good idea. <laughs> but what, what, they, what they actually do is in evolutional biology, they uh, give true skill to monkeys. So they say they, mo they find the most dominant monkey by how many. I'm, I'm, not, I'm not sure exactly on the details, but I think it's either how many other monkeys came to groom them, something like that. <laughs> So, mainly out of curiosity, are there applications of these algorithms outside of sports and video games? Well, the monkeys. Well, and the monkeys. <laughs> okay. so, no, but, but uh, I, I, definitely monkeys. Great monkeys. Um, but uh, but in industry, because I can imagine uh, keeping track of something over time and how well it's performing. That's you know predictive maintenance and all that. That's great. But it's uh, but does it also like? Would, would you be aware of any of these other non-monkey related industry? <laughs> I had the same. I had the same question actually. This is why I know about the monkeys because uh, the only examples I could find were in sociology. And yeah, I, I also wonder why because it's so similar. There was one more question there. Okay, one more question. Sir. Is this correct that the lightning talks are cancelled, or what was it? The keynote. Keynote is cancelled on main hall for your information. Thanks for the talk. Uh, you mentioned in the beginning that uh, also part of your work is uh, to predict which team is gonna win or how likely for a team is going to win and that's how betting companies uh, make the odds before the match. Uh, modern betting companies also have an in-game and all those algorithms are all rating after the game. So mm -hmm. how is the in-game odding getting done? Well, once we are in-game, we can use the in-game measures of the team. So we f can use how much gold they have, which weapons do they have, where are they on the map, etc. And this is, of course, a much better indication of who's going to win than the pre-match rating of the teams. Okay, one more question. One more question, one more question. Yes. Then you are released, Sarina. So I also have question. a question, maybe. Yeah. <laughs> Hello, yeah, thanks again for the great talk. Uh, we thought about another application, and maybe what's your opinion about, for example, ranking sellers of a specific product? Rating what? Um, the, uh, the rating of a, of a seller for a specific of product. Of a seller, so yeah. a vendor, okay. So, for example, yeah, Amazon, mm -hmm. Shopify, whatever. And could you apply a score system based on this so to identify who is the best seller in your history who gave you the best price the best who gave you the best price because um, we are we form a trading desk and mm -hmm. so we don't have the opportunity to ask all vendors all the time because then they get the idea that we want to sell something or that mm -hmm. we want to buy something so we're restricted to ask maybe two or five and we would like to have a scoring system who is the best vendor Yeah, so every time you ask them, you update your belief about uh, how good a price they're going to give you? Yeah, because we get a price from them, but we can't mm -hmm. ask everybody. Yeah, so if you assume that they're going to treat you the same way, no matter for which item you ask the price, I think you should really work. Okay. So I would definitely try it out. and I mean, it's quite e quite simple to try this out, so just give it a go. Yeah, thank you. 
So, does anyone have an idea why this happens with Bayern over there? Please shout loud. Ne. <laughs> Yes, correct, correct, because they didn't lose so many games in, in, in a row that they be, were rating really, really high. If you look at the entire uh, letter set, then this is Bayern. So yes, they have this little drop, but it doesn't. It, they lose one game, they lose a lot of points due to this uh, K behavior, but they're still very, very outranking everybody else, even when Dortmund wins the league. Okay, so thank you very much and a big applause for Davina. Thank you.